Good evening. Recently, I've been reading quite a bit of Louise Glick. I took out a book of her essays, and I also took out this book of poetry, Ararat, from uh, my local library. I thought I'd just share a few poems from this book. starting in the opposite direction, so starting closer to the end of the book. There's this really nice poem that I liked called Snow. Late December, my father and I are going to New York, to the circus. He holds me on his shoulders in the bitter wind. Scraps of white paper blow over the railroad ties. My father liked to stand like this, to hold me so he couldn't see me. I remember staring straight ahead into the world my father saw. I was learning to absorb its emptiness, the heavy snow not falling, whirling, around us, end quote. And so it's, it's such a simple poem. It's such a condensed image. A young girl on her father's shoulders in the wintertime. And this, this idea of her father liked her in the, to stand like this, to hold me so he couldn't see me. Of course, that speaks volumes about the poet's relationship with her father and the nature of that relationship of course gets interrogated throughout the book and also staring straight ahead into the world that my father saw and one of these themes is the way the the poet sort of absorbs the the detachment of her father poem Paradise, I'm just going to read the end, has a really beautiful and complex vision of domesticity, of what it's like growing up in a family, in a rural kind of area. Quote, they always said I was like my father, the way he showed contempt for emotion. They're the emotional ones, my sister and my mother. More and more, my sister comes from the city, weeds, tidies the garden. My mother lets her take over. She's the one who cares, the one who does the work. To her, it looks like country, the clipped lawns, strips of colored flowers. She doesn't know what it once was. But I know, like Adam, I was the firstborn. Believe me, you never heal. You never forget the ache in your side, the place where something was taken away to make another person." End quote. And so we get the biblical illusion here. Like Adam, there are a few really powerful biblical allusions like that scattered throughout the book. And the familial strife, the trauma of having a younger sister, in the sense that our poet feels in competition with her sister. She feels the pain of losing something with the birth of her sister. We, we learn in other poems that her sister was disabled, couldn't walk for a time, and so the mother is always doting and caring for the younger sister. And that, of course, created f familial strife 
some dysfunction in the family, perhaps. You never heal. You never forget the ache in your side, the place where something was taken away to make another person. This poem, Brown Circle, is a poem that I absolutely love. And it speaks to the anxiety of parenthood, the challenges of being a parent, and also the challenges and the anxieties around being a child. The way dysfunction and trauma gets passed down from generation to generation. My mother wants to know why, if I hate family so much, I went ahead and had one. I don't answer my mother. What I hated was being a child, having no choice about what people I loved. I don't love my son the way I meant to love him. I thought I'd be the lover of orchids who finds red trillium growing in the pine shade and doesn't touch it, doesn't need to possess it. What I am is the scientist who comes to that flower with a magnifying glass and doesn't leave, though the sun burns a brown circle of grass around the flower which is more or less the way my mother loved me. I must learn to forgive my mother now that I'm helpless to spare my son. One of the traumas that recurs throughout this book is the fact that the poet's mother lost a child. And there are many beautiful poems that explore that trauma and that theme. This poem is called Lost Love. My sister spent a whole life in the earth. She was born, she died. In between, not one alert look, not one sentence. She did what babies do. She cried, but she didn't want to be fed. Still, my mother held her trying to change first fate, then history. Something did change. When my sister died, my mother's heart became very cold, very rigid, like a tiny pendant of iron. Then it seemed to me my sister's body was a magnet. I could feel it draw my mother's heart into the earth so it would grow." End quote. This is the last poem I'm going to read. It's called Mount Ararat, the same as the title. (laughs) Nothing sadder than my sister's grave, unless it's the grave of my cousin next to her. To this day, I can't bring myself to watch my aunt and my mother, though the more I try to escape seeing their suffering, 
the more it seems the fate of our family. Each branch donates one girl, child, to the earth. In my generation, we put off marrying, put off having children. When we did have them, we each had one. For the most part, we had sons, not daughters. We don't discuss this ever, but it's always a relief to bury an adult, someone remote, like my father. It's a sign that maybe the debt's finally been paid. In fact, no one believes this. Like the earth itself, every stone here is dedicated to the Jewish God who doesn't hesitate to take a son from a mother. That's the poem. I think the title, Mount Ararat, also the title of the book, is a reference to the mountain in the book of Genesis, where Noah's ark landed when the waters began to subside, when the deluge that wiped out civilization started to recede. I think the implication of that poem, the primary image and vision of that poem, is the sense of that biblical God who doesn't hesitate to take children from their mothers. <laughs>